Dear friends and fellow students, we have gathered here together today to honor, to honor the memory of our beloved teacher, our revered guru, Ding Limay, known in this lifetime as Edwin John Dingle, founder of the science of mental physics, the International Church of the Holy Trinity in Los Angeles, and this beautiful spiritual haven here in Yucca Valley, to wing him on his way to the light of everlasting life and to the final awakening. Let us all, at this instant, let us all together be still in his stillness, remembering the first two laws that we learned in the science of mental physics, to be happy, to be happy, and to give thanks. Remembering this, let us then be still in his stillness. I read to us first chapter of St. John, verses 1 to 14. One of the favorite passages of Dingley Mays that I'm sure many of us heard him read many times and refer to the cryptic, mystic meaning of these words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own 
received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave him the power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. Was are born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld the glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. full of grace and truth. Thank you, Reverend Thornton. Now, friends, as Reverend Thor brought to our attention, this was one of our teacher's favorite passages. It deals with the creative word, the creative word. Our teacher taught us that words have great power, tremendous power, and that we live in a world of words. His wisdom, our teacher's wisdom, reflected the truth in the most positive way through books, through lessons, through phonograph records, through tape recordings, the wise words of our beloved teacher taught us the art of living. Being a gifted speaker and writer, Dingham May pointed out on many occasions that the greater or the deeper the feeling, the more difficult it is to portray in words. How well I know that this is true. My desire at this moment is to be able to express the very highest and the deepest feeling of love, the overwhelming gratitude, the great respect and honor we wish to express to and for our beloved teacher. I say we because I know that the many tens of thousands of students all over the world and all of us here express that feeling. If we had words to express them, we feel them in our hearts. For what words, what words could possibly convey our feelings for a man a man who not only brought us into greater knowledge and understanding of self, our own individual self, but led us into a realization, a realization of and a communion with the Lord of Lords, that that men call God. How wonderful it is and how grateful how grateful we are in our feeling. Many times, in his great lesson, the Holy of Holies, our Dingham may taught us to look to nature, observe, learn from nature. Let us today look to nature. You see, everything moves in cycles. And let us consider what is termed to be his life in the cycle of our four seasons, spring, summer, autumn, winter. Spring, what a wonderful word that is, isn't it? A time of birth. 
Our Edwin John Dingle was born in Paynton, Devonshire, England, in 1881. His mother, his mother passed on in his birth. And his father made his transition when Dingle May was at the age of nine. Now, there was a time when it seemed that he and his older brother would be sent to an orphanage. His grandmother refused to allow this and took the two boys to raise. Most students in the science of mental physics, but particularly any student who has ever attended one of Dingle May's conventions, they know how deeply he revered and loved his grandmother. Her care and love was one of the most precious things in his life, for which he was most grateful. And he let us know this many times. Whenever he was in need of discipline, his grandmother would send him up to his bedroom to meditate upon a quotation by Tennyson. And this quotation became his lifelong motto, and I now quote it. The conditions of conquest are easy. We have but to toil a while, endure a while, believe always, and never turn back. <coughs> Following the custom Edwin John and his brother served an apprenticeship, the printing and kindred trades, since their father and their uncle were both newspaper men. But the love and sacrifices of his grandmother for him inspired Edwin John to become a success. So he worked very hard. Having been an orphan, it was his desire to go out into the world and to make a fortune so that he could aid other orphans who had no home nor loved ones who were not as fortunate as he. Later, Dingle May's dream of helping orphans was expanded, enlarged, and merged with his commitment to help humanity by teaching men and women, God's children, the children of God, how to help themselves through his teachings in the science of mental physics. His desire to help, his desire to found orphanages may yet become a reality, has become a reality in other areas, because his dreams and his goals have become the dreams and the goals of countless thousands of other human beings throughout this earth who have done great things because of his inspiration and who have dedicated themselves to the betterment of humanity through love and through service. And our teacher never ceased to admonish us. Service was the most glorious of all activities, service to our fellow human beings. Now we come to the summer, the summer of our teacher's life. Just as the golden wheat grows taller in the summer sun, our teacher grew. We find our Edwin John maturing, becoming a man, beginning to dream his dreams. Having mastered his trade, he accepted a position on the Singapore Straits Times. Later, he became the editor. While actively engaged in the busy life of a newspaper man and editor, seeking the adventures of life, our young Edwin John Dingle was also in the quest of knowledge. His spiritual thirst led him to a man known as the Sage of Singapore, 
who became his first spiritual guide, laying the foundation for his ultimate quest in Tibet. Now to tell our young adventurer that something could not be done or had never been done only increased his determination to accomplish it. China, for the most part, at this time, was a place of mystery, of fascination to the Western world, but mystery. Intrigued by the challenge of mysterious China, young Edwin John Dingle decided to undertake a journey across China. Since there was no public transportation of any kind, he would walk, mapping the territory, rivers, boundaries, and, of course, being a newspaper man, reporting the adventure to readers all over the world. His companion on this adventure was an Australian newspaper man who found early in the trip that the going was too rough, and so he turned back. But our young adventurer, well-schooled in the way of conquest, he pressed on. He would not turn back. And along with the aid of his Chinese guides, he continued his journey. His reports and books about this adventure made him a well-known author. His maps and geographical exploration earned him a fellowship in the Royal Geographical Society of Great Britain and other kindred international societies. Now, since there were so few sources where one could gain even the, well, the meagerest facts about China, Dinga May decided he would enlighten the Western world that he would compile all of the information that he had gleaned and he would continue through others, help from others, and that he would make an atlas and gazetteer, including in it all information on commerce, agriculture, mineral deposits, geographical information, and many maps. You see, at that time, the maps were very poor and inaccurate. Each province had its own language, so to speak, or dialect. And he made the first standardized maps, bilingual, in Chinese and English. Now, when he saw backing from bankers for this great undertaking, they said it could not be done. The project was too big. You know what this did to our teacher and made his determination and inspiration even greater to accomplish it. It took 12 years to compile and edit the information, but the book was an immediate success. The information contained in Dingle's new atlas and commercial gazetteer of China was not only in immediate demand, but the information was still current and vitally essential to our own country during the period of World War II. The book, by the way, was only one of seven, either written or edited and published by our teacher while in the Orient. And it was the largest book ever published to that time in China. It was his pilgrimage into Tibet that proved to be the most important because it was in Tibet that he learned his mission, his real destiny. Time does not permit the explanation of all of the circumstances of how he was led in his travels to Tibet and lived for some time in a Tibetan monastery. There, he was privileged to study under, under a most remarkable Tibetan master 
under the tutelage of his Tibetan guru, Ding Lamei was made spiritually aware of the truths of life. His master speaking to him just before his departure from Tibet prophesied, There will come a time in your life, my son, when nothing will satisfy you but to teach. Years later, in the autumn of his life, he recalled the predictions of his master in Tibet as the urge to teach could no longer be denied. A wonderful feeling, an urge to teach. The autumn of Ding Lamei's life must have seemed, well, just that. Still a young man, his fortune made, he could indeed reap the harvest of his endeavors. In 1921, he came to the United States. He had been told by his doctors in China prior to his departure that in six months he would be totally blind. He was already blind in one eye, and the other eye was rapidly failing. And so the first thing that Ding Lamei did upon arrival in the United States was to go into seclusion upon Mount Rainier. And through a practice divulged to him by his Tibetan master in strict, strictest secrecy, Ding Lamei regained his sight completely. His sight restored, he settled in Oakland, California. Never the type to remain idle, he wrote inspirationally and lectured on his travels. His lecturing led to a request by the New York Psychical Society to lecture on his pilgrimage to Tibet. And after he had lectured, seven people came up and asked him to teach them. Ding Lamei agreed, and the number of students grew. And Ding Lamei founded the science of mental physics in 1927, as he realized that the prediction of his beloved master in Tibet had finally come to pass, that nothing would satisfy him but to teach. Returning to the West Coast, Ding LeMay began to lecture and to hold classes down in the old Trinity Auditorium downtown, until the need for a permanent headquarters and more space become apparent and then our present international headquarters at 213 South Hobart Boulevard and our church was acquired. 1934. At this time, the Institute of Mental Physics and our church were incorporated as a nonprofit organization under the laws of the state of California. During the first decade, of Deng LeMay's ministry, he relied upon personal and class teaching. The second decade, laying the foundation, the home study division was added. In spite of the fact that these were the deep depression years, the home study division grew. And today, over 214,000 students have been enrolled some of whom, by the way, have come great distances to be here with us today. And we are happy and we are grateful to have all of you who with us will pay tribute and honor our beloved teacher. During this period, Ding Lamei taught and lectured regularly. He personally conducted three classes a week in the evenings, as well as counseling, attending to the many administrative duties at the institute and church. And in spite of this heavy schedule, he continued to write lessons on the higher teachings that he had received in Tibet. Ding LeMay became a naturalized American citizen, this, the country of his choice, in 1941. 
And that same year, in 1941, he was inspired to acquire land here in Yucca Valley. His plan to build the model city of brotherly love and to provide a spiritual home for home study students and others where they could come and receive personal instructions in the science of mental physics and to train teachers. At that time, Yucca Valley was open desert, open range, cattle all over the place. The growth of this area brought to fore the feeling of everyone else, I think, that has come up into this beautiful valley. When Dingham may first come up here, he felt something. He had a feeling about the area, and so he acquired the land here. Confirmation on the spiritual qualities of the, this high desert area have come from many spiritual and occult groups who have proclaimed that this area is a chosen place in the New Age. Ding LeMay's heavy schedule was enlarged to allow the supervision of the construction of all the building projects here at our new city because he felt a sacred trust had been placed in him by the supporting student body. And so he personally governed all phases of our building programs. As both the student body and the city grew, Dingley May recognized the need of trained teachers to assist in the personal classes and conventions and to establish future cities of mental physics throughout the world. In 1948, he wrote his preceptor training course, and the first convention held here in 1950 was for initiate preceptors, future teachers. This foresight by our teacher ensures the continuance of his teachings in the manner that he prescribed. His dream of other mental physics centers all over the world is becoming a reality. Our Reverend Thor Thordson has established a center in Iceland. A beautiful valley has been purchased by Reverend Thor and his dedicated students in Iceland, and the story of their progress was recounted in our last November Mansion Builder. And if you did not receive this, I think there are extra copies in the cafeteria if you care for one. There is another center organized and operated by our Reverend Bonnie Williams in Tai Tai, Georgia. A chapel was opened begin the beginning of this year, and land and has been purchased for a center in Springfield, Missouri. And our Reverend Marvin Landwehr is in the process of erecting a center there. For a number of years, classes have been held in homes, in rented halls, all around the country and in foreign countries, held by initiate preceptors and preceptors who have attended conventions and who have become trained teachers. And this is the only this is only the beginning. At least four conventions a year are conducted here in their spiritual haven. Special classes for train, training teachers are conducted at each convention by our senior preceptor, Reverend Grace Cleflin. Students come from all around the world and all walks of life to attend our conventions. Dingley May, our teacher, personally conducted most of the 104 conventions that have been held to date. In 1955, Dingley May began to make use of tape recordings Looking to the future and to the continuation of his teachings, Ding LeMay recorded much of the lesson material for use in teaching classes and for training future teachers. Many of his beautiful classes 
where wisdom seems to flow from his lips in unending stream, have been captured on tape recordings so that students of the future can actually receive much of the wisdom embodied in the science of mental physics in their own teacher's voice. And we all remember hearing our teachers say many times, where you hear the voice of a man, there is the man. Some of our ordained ministers, preceptors, that Dingley may personally train, are with us today to honor him. We also have a group of dedicated initiate preceptors who are in training and will soon go forth to serve where they are needed. We stand together today to honor our teacher, and together, heart to heart, we shall carry on. And so, in the autumn of his life, Reverend Edwin John Dingle, Dingley May, dedicated his life to humanity, inspired many others to accept the custodianship of the human race and served so selflessly in dedication, served with his total self. Greater love hath no man than to lay down his life for his friends. Every life has a life of winter, a time of quietude and inactivity, or so it would seem. Looking deeper into nature, we discover that this is a misnomer. Activity and preparations are continued, preparing for another spring. And so it is with our beloved teacher, Dingley May. Is he gone? No. Those in the higher realms are rejoicing, as they say. He has come. In just the same way, when you expect a baby, and you wait, and finally the time of birth arrives, you rejoice then, and you say, the time has come. In precisely the same way, but more beautifully then, our Dingleme has been born again into a new spring, a new cycle of experiences on a higher plane. Realizing his many accomplishments and the long hours he devoted to his work, those who had the opportunity to observe Dingley May know full well that much of what would be termed his life was placed upon the altar of his dream his dream to help humanity. For too many years he labored unceasingly. And this, now is the time to rest, to be renewed, reborn, into a new spring. Though he has left behind his physical body, the spirit of the mind has been born into a higher realm, and so we should not grieve. When we know what we know, we should rejoice, giving thanks for the privilege of having known him and having known his teachings, having made those teachings our own, for the truth and the understanding of his teachings that they have brought to all of us and which will continue to bless and to enrich humanity throughout the years to come. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. What I have taken away was mine, saith the Lord. And I return it to the place where it belongeth. But the soul which I also gave, 
I carry to a new region of delight. In my hand is the spirit of Edwin John Dingle, and I raise it up to the delightful places that I created for it. Yes, it shall find its light and rejoice because of the glory of my heavens. Glory be to God, eternal creator, quickener of the living, and those that pass from step to step into everlasting life. Onward speed, our beloved teacher, to regions of delight. He shall be recompensed in the wisdom of the Almighty. There is much that I could say to Dingley May's family and to all of those who loved him and to know him was truly to love him. But I know that they find, as I do, great comfort in their belief. How wonderful it is to know that our teacher is alive in God because we know that man is eternally one with God. And this great truth brought home to many, many of us by this man that we honor here this morning will help all of us to overcome the loss of his physical presence and allow us to release and to bless our beloved teacher as he passes on to a new experience of the soul, a new spring. Now we're all children of God, and realizing this, we release our beloved teacher from our own personal love and to the larger concept of love, love that is of the Spirit. For as much as we love a person, for as much as we might depend upon him materially, emotionally, or even spiritually, when that person, as we say, departs, we are still loved, we are still cared for, for that that we felt was of God. God's nearness, God's support, God's love. Could anyone prove this truth to us more positively than our own beloved teacher? When we needed knowledge, he taught us. When we needed guidance, his wisdom and light showed us the way. How many times, when we were passing through a difficult period, we felt our teacher with us, remembering his words as if he were by our side, by our side, as he is now, and we found the courage, we found the courage and the guidance and the strength necessary to carry on, to move ahead. And remembering now all that he taught us, let us look upon our teacher with a newer, larger vision, so that love and courage remain. And we press forward. And we will uncover a faith, I am sure, that perhaps we never knew existed. Stronger, more sure, more ready. It's there. It's ours. And then, then let us feel joy. The joy of knowing that life is eternal. A great joy that there is no separation in the spirit, the joy of knowing that God is always there, lifting us with everlasting arms, giving us the strength, and making us know that all is well. Reverend Edwin John Dingle, beloved teacher, your breathing now has ceased as you have come face to face with the clear light, 
and you are to experience it in reality, wherein all things are like the void and cloudless sky. At this moment, you know yourself, and you abide in your highest consciousness. You are endowed with a power that is all-pervading. You are in the pure silence necessary for the disciple, the heart, the emotions, and the intellect being stilled. Thou art not distracted. Thou art not indecisive. Thou art wisdom, and love, love embraceth thee. We pray for thee that thou wilt hold to thy single purpose. We give thanks for thee, and on thy journey to the heights, our highest thoughts will ever accompany thee, so far as true understanding in us lies. O nobly born, thou knowest how full well that man cannot die. There never was a time when thou and we were not. There never will be a time when we shall not be. Thou and we are one with God. And when man has conquered every foe on the plane of the soul, the seed, which is man, will have fully opened out into the holy breath of life. Thou art on thy way to attain the blessedness of perfection and to be at one with God. Dingley May, beloved teacher, though we shall never again look upon thy human face as a fellow traveler along the path, in our memories thou shalt live forever. Your light of wisdom shall continue to burn. We see thee as one of the higher workers for all good. We know thy spirit, and may we all together rest in the spirit of the Father, Mother, God of this unchanging universe. And so, with our highest thought and noblest desires for good, in our love and with our love, we wing thee on thy way to the center of the eternal light. Yes, our beloved teacher will always be with us. May we now, all of us, be inspired to hold high the torch, the torch of wisdom entrusted to us by our teacher. As we together, gratefully, follow his teachings, endeavoring to do with the best of our ability that which we know, <clears throat> now friends, let us all feel together as I read to us the 23rd Psalm. <clears throat> Read it with your hearts. Feel into the very depths of your being. Know it to be true. Feel it. Become it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. 
thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal Father, Mother, God, today our hearts are full of love, supported by joy, gratitude, as together we honor a man who is taking up the torch that we all may see more clearly. And we pray, O Father of light, that we may, in all that we think, feel, say, and do, emulate, image thy perfection. As Jesus the Christ admonished us to be perfect as the Father. And, O oh, Father of light, we pray that all of us, hand to hand, heart to heart, may dedicate and rededicate ourselves anew in a new spring in our own endeavors to more fully live what we know, to become ambassadors of the Spirit, true bearers of light. We pray that we may have the humility and the sincerity to constantly look within ourselves and never blame the other fellow, never condemn but to do as our teacher so valiantly taught us, to constantly do that that we have at hand, to further the brotherhood of man, the fatherhood of God, here on this beautiful earth. And so, we ask thy blessings on Reverend Edwin John Dingle, May he be led anew, carrying on in the highest ideals and singleness of purpose. May we all as little children feel and know that we are always in thy, thine own everlasting arms, that we are never alone. May we, in joy and in gratitude and in true humility, carry that torch high, O Father of light, Father of all, we pray that we may, in our own time and generation, do thy holy will. And for all that we are, for all that we have, we give thee thanks, O Lord our God. We give thanks. We give thanks. We give thanks.
Reverend Edwin John Dingle, in our love and with our love, we bring thee on thy way to the center of the eternal lights. Reverend Edwin J. Dingle, Ned, in our love and with our love, we bring thee on thy way to the center of the eternal light. Dingley May, in our love and with our love, we bring thee on thy way to the center of the eternal light.